Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given each one of us to be here to gather in this building they call church, but we know, dear Lord, that your children make the church. And we thank you for that, dear Lord, through your son's sacrifice for us. We are here to sacrifice our time for him and to learn from God's word. We just ask that you touch Josie's heart, dear Lord. Give her the words that you want us to hear, to learn from, to grow on, so we can stand strong for you in our daily lives. So just bless each one here, dear Lord, with the word that's about to be brought to us. Lift us up, clear our heads, clear our ears, and open our hearts to your word. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so praise God. So um, we're talking about, we're going to talk today, especially, about the word. Uh, these next months, we're going to try to get into all these things. Word, service, prayer, one at a, once a week. We'll look, dive into one of them and try to understand why they are important and, and what we can do with them and what they want to do with us. So today, I had to choose so much we can say. I had to choose one scripture about the word that I wanted us to just focus on. You know, sometimes when I preach, I go from, like last week, it was from Exodus to, <laughs> to, the, to the epistles of, of Paul. Today, no. Today, we are going to narrow and look at two verses and we're going to really try to see what are they telling us about the word of God. So in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, we have these wonderful verses that start with all scripture is breathed out by God. Or we know it in other versions, inspired by God. We'll see them. But the point is, it starts declaring something really important, guys. That's, that psalm that I'm encouraging the youth, or actually all of us, to read every day, it's more than just words to read. There's something in this book. Where is it? Here it is. There's something in this book that is just not in any book. You just can't find it. And it's because these scriptures are breathed out by God, are inspired by God. And so let's go and look at, our, uh, at these verses. So as you see, I, I did a little thing. I, I wanted to look at different versions, just because, you know, inspired, breathed out, why do we have different words to say the same thing? So I started with Tom's favorite, King James Version, and maybe the favorite of other ones here. And this is how it says, it says, all scripture, so all scripture, and I have to be honest, if we think about it, you know what it's talking about? We think, oh, it's talking about our Bible, Josie. Actually here, it's just referring to the Old Testament. The one that we think, oh, that's the Old Testament, right? I'm going to start the New Testament. This is where it's about me. But you know what? The New Testament tells us that the Old Testament <laughs> it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And Lord willing, next year, we are going to go through this beautiful adventure. If you want, with us, you are going to read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one year. And we're going to see this story. But this is important to know if we're going to do that, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's where we're going to be praying for each other, right? That we can all be pure and walk in righteousness. Well, the word, the scripture is important for this. What's the purpose? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's go to the... Revised Standard Version. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for the training in righteousness. It's a little bit different. Here it adds the idea that I need to be trained in something, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's go to the English Standard Version. I know some of you read that one. All scripture, and this is where we have this expression. It's breath out by God. Think about it, even inspired. Inspired talks about the breathing, right? You inspire air. It's, it's something that's giving us that life that's being breathed out. And so it says, it's breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. NIV, all scripture is God breathed. 
and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So first it says complete. Somewhere it says perfect. Here it says thoroughly equipped. It's talking about a way that we need to become. And now I go in the versions that were like, uh, they try to expand a little bit, right? So the New Living Translation and the Message Bible. Now this is where the you youth will probably enjoy this a little bit more because it gives a little more explanation. Here it says, all scripture is inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong. Okay, so it kind of expands that idea of correcting and reproofing, right? So realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip us, his people, to do every good work. One more. We should memorize. I mean, we should have had this memorized, okay? If you go home and you don't remember this verse, then <laughs> every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another. I like this. Showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task that God asks, has for us. Isn't that beautiful? Did, you, did we hear it? Did, it? did it always become a little clearer? And I'm teaching you a little, a little strategy. If you're looking into something in the word, this is just a technique if you want. Go and read different versions. It will help bring more meaning to what you're reading. And then, why not in Italian? Tutto ciò che è scritto nella Bibbia è stato ispirato da Dio e serve ad insegnarci la verità, ci convince, ci corregge, ci aiuta a fare ciò che è giusto. In questo modo il credente viene perfezionato e preparato a fare opere buone. Got it? Amen? Amen. Do we all agree with this translation? We all agree. That's because the word of God is for all of us. And it's really important. So I want to stop on, these, on the things that this verse is telling us. First of all, it's telling something about the breath of God in this word. Now, scholars could be here debating. We won't do that. What does this exactly mean? Did God, like, did they hear his voice and they wrote? Did God, you know, how did it happen? How did it happen, you know? But, you know, technically, what does this mean? Now, we could, we could go into all that, but there's one thing that we can't miss if we think of the word of the breath of God somehow related to scripture. Because the breath of God, it says it's given by inspiration, it's inspired by God, it's breathed out by God. Is God breath? What does it bring to our mind if we think about that? See, I think of God's breath that gives life, doesn't it? It brings things to life. In Genesis, right, we are the only creatures of God that bear his image. The animals don't. Nature doesn't. As beautiful and respectful we have to be. But what's the difference when God created us? What did he do after he formed human being? He breathed into him. Yes. His breath made him become a living soul. The breath of God, if it's there in something, it brings life. It makes this become more than just written words. That word that we saw, the scripture of God, just means what is written here, the words that are here. But the fact that they have been breathed out, that somehow God has, in, has given his thought to people so that they could convey who he is. It's not magic, but it's truth, it's power, it's life. So guys, when we look around, we see a lot of people that are living and not living, don't we? A lot of people that are just crushed by their lives, crushed by the weight of, of things that are going wrong in their lives. But there's life in here. There's life in God's word. And so this recalls this beautiful verse to me where it talks about 
the word of God. Now here, when it says the word of God, it doesn't say scripture. I like this. It uses another Greek word. It's logos. And logos means the whole thought of God. You see, it's not the matter that every single word is what the exact word, you know, that God, because this, this book has been translated <laughs> for centuries in so many, in so many different languages. But the logos, the thought that God had, he preserved it in this book for us. And look what Hebrew says. The word of God is alive. It's alive. When you're reading that book, you're reading something that is alive. Not the book in itself, but the thought that's in that book and that wants to reach your heart, it's alive. It's alive and it's active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. This is not things we want to play with. The word of God is nothing we want to take lightly. The word of God wants to go deep into us. It wants to do something because it's alive. It can't just stop here. We don't read, we don't tell you guys, or we don't tell us to read just so our knowledge can expand. If I'm encouraging you, if we are encouraging each other to be devoted to the word, it's because there's life in there. It's active. God breath it. So this is something really important. When, you, when we do it, when we approach it, let's not forget that it's more than just a book of doctrines or rules or regulations or stories. There's life. There's God's breath in it. Now let's see what about the relationship between scripture and us. That's the relationship between scripture and God. That's what God does to, that, that did to scripture. He breathed in it his life so it could give life to us. So what does this book do to us? What did this word, this message? So I love it. The first, it's four things. And when you go home, you'll have to repeat to yourself. You'll say, I know the four things that scripture does to us. So first of all, it teaches us the truth. It says that it gives us doctrine. It's for teaching, for teach us what is true, for showing us the truth. Now, I, I'm sorry that Darwin's not here today because I'm going to talk about him. So <laughs> you're going to have to tell him that I'm not talking bad about him. <laughs> no, <laughs> when I was going through this, I was thinking about this idea of teaching. And I know that Darwin has been math teacher for many of you. Many of you share that, right? Uh, so Mr. Eagleff, right? That's how you, as a teacher, that's how we would refer to him. Now, what does a teacher do? A teacher first, he teaches the truth. Now, in math, I know that today there's a lot of debate on what's truth and not truth. In math, Darwin would have said, OK, let's talk about little children. I don't know what age he taught. Two plus two is four. And that's a fact. He would have said, if you think it's four, it's four. If you don't think it's four, OK, whatever you say is good. No. <laughs> that he would have been teaching good math. And his students today would be kind of screwed up in this world with their budget if that's what he would have taught, right? So I'm sure he gave them the truth. Two plus two is four. That's the teaching. That's what the word of God does to us. He reveals us some truths. Who is the truth? The way and the life, Jesus. He shows us what is true. Not here, here. What it means to be true, what it means to live truth. He gives us that. And guys, you didn't go to school or, or, I mean, especially our younger generation immersed in our ideas. Now, in the past, I think they would just, they would believe that there was a truth, but they would just say, you know, I have mine, yours is yours, but we believe that ours is the actual truth. Today, the idea is, you know what? There's really not a truth. Believe what you want, and that's good. I think today is even more deceiving than in the past because we don't even admit sometimes that there is a truth. Well, the Bible is saying, hey, there is a truth, and this word will teach you. I don't care what your friends tell you. I don't care what you have thought or believed for 90 years of your life. If this word reveals you a truth, we are to believe that it's true because it's breath by God. Amen? So that's the first thing. Two plus two is four. 
I taught it. But then, and I love this, the order that Paul gave to this. He says, then the scripture rebukes us. That means it says it reproof, it rebuking, and then it says it makes us realize what is wrong in our life. It exposes our rebellion. Okay, Josie, can we skip that part? <laughs> I don't like that part very much, okay? I like, I like to be able to go around and say, hey, I've got the truth, because that makes me even feel better than others, but don't, don't tell me that I have to read this book and that it'll probably rebuke me. Uh, it will. It will. It will show us, it will help us realize what is wrong. It will expose our mistakes and our rebellion. Now, if Mr. Igloff had a student that came to him with a test and had two plus two is five, if he would have said, okay, that's fine. If it's good for you, I'll give you an A, would he have helped his student? He wouldn't have. So he has to rebuke, he has to reproof, and he has to tell him, and that's not always easy. You know what, this is wrong. Think of a little six-year-old doing math <laughs> and having to tell him this is wrong. It breaks our heart, doesn't it? We don't want to, right? It's like, oh, why do I have to tell him it's wrong? Maybe I'll just find it. But if you're a teacher and you love your student and you want them to learn, you will say, this is wrong. And that's what God will tell us. And I love because this reproof and rebuke, it's all in the context a lot of how a parent would, would rebuke or reproof a child, like out of love, right? So the Lord could be touching us something. He could say, you know what? Hey, the way you're handling your business, it's wrong. You're not being honest. Uh, the way you're loving your wife, it's wrong. You're not really loving her. Or the way you're respecting your husband. It's wrong, you're not really respecting him. The way you're, re you're, you're rebuking your child, your children, you're not rebuking them out of love. You're doing it out of anger. That's not how it's supposed to be. Those words, those truths could rebuke us and show us where we are wrong. But Lord, but I really intended good. I was telling my son because what he did was wrong. And, and the word is saying yes, but when I rebuke you, I do it with love. Or it's like, but Lord, I just can't get through in my business. If, I, if, I, if I'm totally honest, that's too much. I know, but I told you to be faithful. I will provide for you. You know, that he rebukes us, and we need to accept that. We need to desire that, honestly. Lord, show me where I'm wrong. Show me where in my life I am not walking according to your life. Show me where on the test I wrote two plus two is five. Tell me that that is wrong. I need, I need to hear that from you. And so then, after this, and remember that the Bible says that the, that I, I, the, the picture, when I was looking, I put rebuke, you know, and I, and, or reproof, and I'm like, oh, that picture with the finger pointed, we, don't, we never want those pictures, that's not nice, we don't point fingers. No, God points fingers. He does. <laughs> he points fingers to us. He wants to. He's like, hey, I'm looking at that. That's, you know, you're not forgiving or you're not, oh, you're gossiping about someone. He points that finger. And I'm not pointing to anyone intentionally. I'm just saying, he points finger. The Bible points his finger to us. And we need to accept that. And we need to love that too. So then, again, what does Mr. Igloff does? He doesn't just say, nope, five is wrong. Goodbye. <laughs> he doesn't leave you with the reproof and the rebuke because that would be very bad. I wouldn't know how to fix it. I wouldn't know how to change it. So what does he do? This says that the scripture corrects us. It gives us correction. It corrects us when we are wrong. It correct, it's correcting our mistakes. So Mr. Eagles would cross the five and write the four. This is the right answer. And that's what scripture does to us. It corrects us. It says, hey, you're going in this direction. This is how it's supposed to be. You're living this kind of relationship with that person. It's not good. This is how it's supposed to be. He corrects us. He tells us how we can adjust our life. And even then, after Mr. Eagleff has crossed that five and put their four, there's still one other thing that that little boy will need if, 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 we re if he really loves him and he wants him to learn. And he will need this. He will need training. 
he will need training. So maybe Mr. Igloff would say, okay, so do this. Put two fingers up, put another two fingers up, count them, one, two, three, four. You got the answer. And maybe the little boy will start doing that. And after he does it one, two, five, ten times, he won't need to put his fingers up anymore. He will know two plus two is four. And that's how God trains us. It says he instructs us in righteousness. He's training in righteousness. He teaches us to do what is right. He's training us to live God's way. That's why I put training wheels. You know, this idea of something that will help us. He will give you direction. He will help you. He will start telling you what to do so that you can learn how to do it his way. How can you learn to be honest? How can you learn to not gossip? How can you learn to really love others? How can you learn to be respectful? How can you learn to live a, a honor and pure sexual life? Remember when I showed you that our life, we could divide it like in eight sections. Our finances, our, our, our relationships, our job, our environment. How can I learn to take care of my body as God wants me to? How can I learn how? God is going to, the word is going to train you. He's going to train you. Now, when he trains you, you have to respond. If Mr. Igloff tells a little boy, put two fingers and two fingers, if he doesn't put those two fingers there, he'll never get the right. If he says, no, I'm just going to try it my way. I'm going to remember. Next time, two plus two, six. You know, it's like, I gave you. I gave you a way to know the answer. God gives you a way. He gives you a way. It's in here, though. And, you know, it says that, to say, for the, for, the, for the scripture, there's three different words. We saw that in our Bible study on, on Wednesdays. There's the written word, then there's the logos, God thought, and then there's what they call rema. Rema is when God speaks to you specifically. And you know, he's like, okay, Carrie, to fix this in your life, you know what? Do this. Like, I don't know. Um, Carrie's like, Lord, I, I want to read your scripture every day. I know it's important. I just can't get to it. And I try. He's like, okay, you have to do this. Set your alarm, alarm five minutes before you start your day. Do that. He's, he's like, he breathes something in her that is specifically for her to help her, to train her. And you know, for the first month, Sometimes she will, sometimes she'll knock off the, the alarm clock and fall back asleep, but she'll keep on trying, keep on trying. And then at a certain point in her life, she'll wake up without even that alarm. And the first thing she'll want to do, I want to go and read that Bible, because she'll be trained in that. So the word of God can train us and teach us. Isn't that wonderful? Is that wonderful? And at the end, why? Chelsea, why? Why would I have to undergo all this? Can I just leave it on my counter, get some dust, possibly not come to church, or if I come to church, I'll nap during the, the, the preaching time. Can I just put it there? I'll just go to heaven one day when it's time. That's all. That's all I want, Josie. Nothing else. But look what it says. What, what is the effect of the scripture on the man or how it says you're the servant or the people of God? To be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. To be complete complete. Don't we want to be complete? Do you want to be complete? Equipped for every good work. To be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Through the word we are put together, I like this expression, and we are shaped up for the task God has for us. Okay, so as a church, we are asking God to use us, are we not? We are saying, God, we want to be used by you. We want to do your works. Well, the only way that we will be ready to do those works is if we, we let the word of God equip us. That's the only way. If we let it do what it has to do in us, then we will be ready. If not, we won't. We want to do what God wants us to do according to his will. You need to be equipped. I need to be equipped. There's no way it will happen if we're not. So what I'm saying here is the word of God needs to have an important place in our life. We need to love it and be devoted to it. And he'll teach us how to do that, but it has to be there. It's not only what we've learned in the past, it's what it can tell us every day so that we are equipped to do his work. So while we worship and we encounter in our God in our worship, please let that word go in, do its work like a sword, and if he's rebuking you for something, allow that to happen. 
If you need to come here and pray, come here and pray. If you need to ponder things, if you need to be trained, if you need wisdom, we're a body and we're here together to be trained by the word of God, to be equipped so can we, can, we can do his work. None of us is already fully equipped. We continually need training. So let's be sure that we give our heart to that. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the beauty of what you have given us. I pray, Lord, that we really allow your word to do all these things. We believe that it's spread from you. We pray that it will teach us, that it, Lord, may rebuke us, show us where we're wrong. May it correct us, Lord. Show us how it should be done. And may it train us so that we can learn how to walk in that righteousness, so that we can be a light for the world, for the people around us, Lord. So we can be doing things not for our glory, but for your glory alone. So that we can see what you works you have prepared for us, not the ones we want to ask you to do through us, Lord. It's your works, the one you have prepared for us to accomplish. Please, let your word become truth for us, alive in us and working in our lives. May us be excited to see it transform our lives so that we can serve you, Lord, and honor you in every way. In the name of Jesus, amen.